Dave. Poor Dave is in the hospital, so... says there are children starving in Biafra. They can have my meat, I mutter as I spit or spit partially chewed, a partially chewed bite into my napkin. The gag reflex is in full swing as I buy the pale gray slice of beef on my plate. I can see the vein. True enough, there is a small cylinder of vein that I know had blood pumping through it. There is the edge of fat lining the slice and the gelatinous mass of gravy pretending to cover the offending hole. My mother pokes at it with a fork. That is nothing. My shoulders round and curl over the plate. Maybe she won't notice me hiding bits and pieces under the mashed potato or sliding something under the limpid succotash mix, but my grandmother does. Green-eyed and eagle vision, she can spot a canapa. Excuse me. Act of deception from way across the table. What's that on your napkin? Nothing, I say as I mound the soggy piece deeper into my lap. Let me see it. I can feel my face getting red. There is no fighting the she-demon. My mother taps my hand and I unfold my damp fingers. My mother takes it. Peeling it apart, she reveals a revolting mass of partially chewed beef. This is a waste, you know, a waste of perfectly good meat. You know there are starving children. My grandmother would never mention Biafra. She cared nothing for anyone from a foreign land. She makes me sit there until I eat all the beef on my plate, even the hidden pieces under corn and lima beans and the hardened mass of potatoes. My sister, five years older, snickers. She loves meat and cleans her plate. She helps my mother do the dishes. I can't even get a clean napkin for disposal. I hate this. It wasn't until years later when my grandmother took to marking time with the local butcher that I could appreciate the finer qualities of a good hunk of beef. The butcher was bold and brassy and unleashed my mother's hidden wild side. He would bring roast beef that had been rubbed with spices like oregano, black pepper, and garlic. It would cook until it turned to burnish brown and the gravy was dark and rich and made you want to lick your plate. His mashed potatoes were creamy, buttery mounds of pleasure. With him, we learned not to cook out of cans. And when he put a slice of meat on my plate, it was trimmed of any offending cartilage or fat. It cut with a fork and melted in your mouth. The others would wrinkle their noses. Too much garlic. But I would just shovel it in my neck and free to wipe my buttery, gravy buttered lips. The butcher would turn out to have too much of a wild side, but he left a legacy of learning to love good beef. Years later, I am still repulsed by strange cuts of meat. Slabs, well done dog, itchy kangaroo, or dark buffalo bits are never making it to my plate. But on a cold winter's day, beef done to perfection, and creamy mashed potatoes will make me warm and cozy. 
It won't be the fond memories around the kitchen table I recall, but the day a bold and brassy butcher unleashed my wild side and took me from a meat-spitting wee wisp of a girl into learning the pleasures of simple food done right. spring was just a good idea. Not a tree fought further than to catch a snowflake upon a branch. Mother Nature heaved tears upon a grateful earth that such a creature as me was being born. No, that's not right. The sky was a slate gray of cumulus clouds. No, that's not right either. I really do not know what the weather was on the day I was born. I was too busy contemplating my penis. Yes, I was a girl child, but convinced the pulsating thing I'd grown so fond of in utero was indeed my penis. How was I to know it would be the last time I would be so intimately involved with it? And my kneecaps, hanging out in the dark, sucking your thumb, and pondering the next term, turn in the womb does not prepare you for life. Much later, I stood naked, waiting for my bath, and realized it was gone. Gone? I asked my mother where it was, and she said, why, well, it dried up and fell off. <laughs> fell off? My trusty companion from nine months, my playmate, the thing I was counting on to wheel power in a man-infested environment had dried up and fallen off? I can tell you nothing prepares you for a shock like that. On the day I was born, God peered into the waiting room of my mother and shook his head to see this girl baby contemplating her penis. I think he knew right then I was trouble. Years later, I'd grow up to be a wild woman, a wild angel, and crazy about my pet TV, my computer, and a boy named George. But that is another story. I was born with a cleft in my chin. I was told that God, that meant God had put his fingerprint on me. So this is what I think happened. God looked in utero, saw what was going on, and decided action was needed. He lifted my head back, peered into my baby blues, and said, look you goofball, what are you doing? Stop mucking around and get the hell out of there. With that, he pushed his finger into my chin and set me holding onto my penis for dear life down the long tunnel to the light at the other end, his final words ringing in my ear. You go, girl, go and fly. <laughs> fight. I listen. He begs her to let him in. She does, again and again. Their bodies clash, their bodies glass wood crash to the floor, my ceiling. In the dark I listen to their life shattering. Below I sing to myself, 
I think one day her blood will drip through the floor. The warm drop will bless my head and we will both be reborn. I sing to myself. A poem. His finger brushed her hip, penetrating to the bone. Fallen. I was taught there were two kinds of women. Fallen, scraped knees. Virgin, blue robes. But you get to give birth to the big kahuna in the form of the sun. Is that right? What choice did they give us? Honey, by the band-aids, I fell down again. <laughs> Apple. Eve, mother, remember the taste of the first apple? Teeth tearing into flesh, ooze of warm juice between your teeth. Feel as sharp edges and soft pulp down into your belly. Heady surge of infinite knowledge racing through your veins. Alive, cell, heart, mind, flesh, spirit, soul. Then you knew, woman, to your side, man. Hand over mouth. Ah, oh, what have you done? Written on a subway wall. Where in my body does God live? Falling. Eve, mother, do you remember falling into the world, cursed for your appetite, life? Did the knowledge drive you crazy? Like my smelly, blind, and nuts grand grandmother in Creedmoor. Or the one who took to slimy, abusive men and drinking. I think it was all the birthing that drove them crazy. Feeding all that life. Passing on some whispered secret in the womb. It was the crazy one that carried her little deformed baby. Girl, redheaded too, like my father. So that she could die at 19. My father gone at 42. It was the drunken one that told the crazy when her last child had died, making her blind. Crazy with sorrow, alone in some insane asylum, remembering something. What was the taste? Another poem found on a subway wall fall open like a pear, split down the middle. Singing. Last week I had come up with my own, I had to come up with my own special song. I tried, but I couldn't hear anything. I sing the first song my mother taught me, pantomiming it to my then four-year-old self. How dry I am, how wet I'll be. If I don't find the bathroom key, I found the key. I opened the door, but it's too late. It's on the floor. I bless her infinite patience. <laughs> stand on corners looking for stars. Full moon hungry. Come, my love, and slip down beside me. I am full moon hungry, and tonight it is the brightest of the year. Empty of you, finally, after a long illness, took the last breath of my body. I measure each action as victory, marking time by each day I wake. 
greet the morning reluctantly still. After all this time, it is the moon that feeds me, moving lambently across my breast, filling me with its light and grace. I will tell you when I have reclaimed my life, moving past the shadow of this illness, I curl into the smallest shaft of light. I will drink until I am full. Eat a rainbow with one hand open, palm up to the world. Receive this as if water poured from the mouth of God. A body of work. I am lined like an ancient river that once flowed east into the great sea. A body forlorn and bound to its remembrances. See me from above the shadow sister next to the river that once flowed, now flows west. If you were to explore me, rock and bone now ground into pans, pale sand along the urban highway, I would show you the path of water that once raged against my ample shores. shores. This river is bound to the earth, waiting for the end of the world and the final rain and the one great wave that will wash me once again into the sea. I don't know about the flesh falling and flailing from the bone, about the dark, the night creeping into every corner, where the air is any more pure and cheaply as a still frame, why my mouth won't open, won't scream or cry or sing. I don't know. 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 tracing memory along my thigh. What women in love do, throw off our coats to reveal bare shoulders, dance in front of the mirror. What women in love do, become unhinged in subtle and profound ways, slightly crazy and beside ourselves. We become different, awkward, and out of sorts. When we fall, for married men, mysterious men, and holy men, forgetting ourselves in love in the most awful and luscious ways, women in love do the most interesting things. Today, I'm a woman in love, and my heart aches. I met a madman on a waterbed cursing at the sky. He rocked me, rocked me with his wooden oar and then licked my river dry. I have known love, she said. The burn of cigarettes, the hatch marks of white lies across my back. Don't let me languish here, waking from a wet dream, glistening with desire. What women in love do, revealing bare shoulders, she slips back her coat.
this world behind. I could crash if I wanted to and spin myself at a time. Instead, I say, you must write, girl. Take your pencil. Scrape some lead across the paper. Lick the lead off the white. Lick between the lines. Oh, God, tongues are so useful, so sinewy, primed for expiration. If one could prod between a verb and an adjective, flick the flavor from a word, would an orange taste the same as a word lobbed around the tongue? I don't know. Would my tongue feel the delicate line the words rest on? Would each greenish blue line have a texture different from the stark white of the paper it rests on? Could I pluck them like a musical instrument? Or would the lines feel like the thread I run through my mouth when I pre prepare to thread a needle, so close to slicing my tongue? If words were a meal, if novels were a banquet, if poetry were dessert, both bitter and sweet, if I could lick up each word from the paper, would I be satisfied? Or would I hunger for more? Would I want to lick the posters on the subway? Taste the salt of a thousand hands, the thickness of each letter rendered an idea like a virus in my mouth. Would my tongue taste to take a chance on the deep well of the you and Tom Cruise's name? Would it tingle with excitement over the title of an adventure movie? Or would a love story melt like warm chocolate over the over my tongue and down the sides of my mouth? Have I become dreamy with the prospect of licking the vowels in your name? Running my tongue over your hyphenation? Spelling you with each flick of a capital letter? Would betrayal taste as sour written on parchment? Would I get more from rice paper? Would a fountain pen give words more flavor? Would my tongue delight in the same with a flare pen? I dreamt of you writing a song on the white of my torso, your mouth creating rhythm and harmony over the crest of a well-rounded hip. Each word flayed my flesh and I was well-written, and you told me that I tasted like whiskey on a cold day, burning your mouth with music. Oh, I licked the lead from the paper and I swallowed the words in bits and pieces. Can I ever be satisfied? And before I end my last piece, I want to thank Jed for Luckless for playing with me. Thank you. And for, I mean, this was just a week ago that we sort of got together and made this all up. So this is sort of a first time adventure. I want to thank Robin who um, allowed us in here at the last minute when poor Dave went into the hospital. So thank you, Robin. And I just want to let you know that as soon as I finish my last piece, Jed, who was an excellent musician, by the way, will keep playing for a little bit. So if you want to hear more of his excellent playing, stay around. Or you can find him on Ustream, he's there too. She held her hands over her ears as if to contain the sound in her head, the whooshing, the roar, the sound of thunder. Walking on broken glass might have been better than bearing this feeling that had settled just below her ribcage. If she could, she'd open up her belly and let the creature out that had taken shape there. It whispered to her, don't be afraid of love. 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 But this creature gave her no peace. It did not tell her how to bear the burning, the pain, the torment, the sensation of having your skin peeled in tiny strips, until all she could hear was this roar. Don't be afraid of love. 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 Don't be afraid of love.